Welcome back, fellow chess bums. Today, one more interview in our series. We're having Abby Fong from Impacts Records and Chuck Granada talking about Impacts One Step Frank Sing and Nestor Frank Sinatra. Before I kick it over to Mike to, uh, to make our intro, please like and subscribe, follow Discord, our Instagram servers. Uh, plenty of uh, good uh, discussions there. So, Mike. All right. Thank you, Felipe. Uh, before we get started, I want to just kind of do a quick uh, snapshot of Chuck's um, career here. So um, he's a record producer, a music historian, author, and archivist. Um, and he preserves uh, a lot of old material, including Frank, uh, Frank Sinatra's catalog for Sony. Um, so he does a lot of restoration and production. Um, so he did the Frank Sinatra in Hollywood, the Grammy nominated A Voice on Air. Um, and he uh, has collaborated with Andres Meyer um, and some and some other people too. He 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 works with transcription discs from the 30s and 40s, as well as acetate masters and magnetic tapes. So we'll get into a little bit of that um, detail a little bit later for this specific title that we're talking about. He's written a number of books, um, including kind of the uh, the a seminal piece on Frank Sinatra's recording career. I have it behind me. It's um, Sessions with Sinatra. Um, highly recommend that for anybody who's diving into Frank's um, catalog. And he's worked with uh, Impex. So AB here um, is the owner and CEO of Impex Records, and they have collaborated on a number of titles, which we'll get into. Um, I believe the list includes the Getz Gilberto One Step, the Heifetz the Lark, which is a great classical title, um, as well as Sing and Dance with Frank Sinatra. And he's had a number of collaborations with Monica Getz, Lowell Banana Levenger, Al Di Miola, Johnny Mandel, and many others. Um, and personally, as a Sinatra collector, I have been reading and following Chuck's work for uh, a number of years. It is truly an honor to have um, him on the channel. So thank you, Chuck and A.B., welcome. Um, so let's get into it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. It's wonderful stuff. Yeah, again, thanks for joining us, guys. Um, the first question is, how did you two kind of meet and start working together? Well, I think it was by happenstance, but but it was a great moment when my engineer, Andreas Meyer, was working with me on a voice on air for Sony and I was in the studio and I was flipping through some albums that he had sitting on the shelf. And I came across some of the Columbia and RCA classical albums that he had mastered for Impex. And uh, loving those albums, I was intrigued and I picked them up and he said, why don't you take a few? He said, they're from Impex Records and they're really good. So I brought them home and I remember taking one of the Leonard Bernstein albums and putting it on the turntable. And I was immediately captivated because this was truly vinyl and analog sound that was a cut above. And I called Andreas immediately and said, oh my gosh, these records are beyond what modern records are. They're really well produced and well manufactured and the, the packaging is beautiful. I said, I would love to do something with them on a Frank Sinatra project. And that's where it started. Andreas connected me with AB and I'll let her take it from there. I think we met in California, right? Didn't we have lunch one day? Yeah, we, yeah. We had lunch one day, we met in California. You came and visit and this was pre COVID. I think we started yes. talking around end of 2018, 19. Um, I hadn't done a Sinatra release and uh, Chuck, uh, I made a suggestion. We loved his idea. We started mapping out what a concept album would would look like. And it was just thrilling to be able to work with a historian, a producer. His depth of knowledge on Sinatra was so amazing. I knew we could come up with a definitive version of anything we wanted to do. Hmm. And I felt the same way. I really had... Uh great love for what AB and her team was doing. So I I was really just so happy to be connected with her and to be able to bring this project uh, to the table. It's um, really amazing. So when, when discussing, uh, when you're thinking about Sinatra specifically, Chuck, 
uh, you have access to um, a specific era and catalog of Sinatra. Can you tell us um, kind of what you have access to? Well, I began working as a consultant at Sony Music in 1992. Sony Music was going to issue the complete Columbia recordings of Frank Sinatra, which is his first solo period as an artist. And it fell between 1943 and 1952. And Legacy Recordings, which was the catalog division of Sony, hired me to work with them on that box set. It was a 12 CD set. And they were so happy with what we did that they asked me to be the project director and co-producer for all of the rest of the Sinatra series that they had planned. And that's really where it started for me. I ended up working at Warner Reprise, where I did Frank Sinatra in Hollywood, which is something oh, wow. I mentioned up in the in the beginning. Uh, I've worked at Capital EMI on projects with them. Oh, so wow. I really was able to, to kind of spread my wings a little bit. And of course, I met Nancy Sinatra. We became close friends and colleagues for many years. And 32 years later, I'm still working on Sinatra project, projects, primarily at Sony. Uh, and and it's just really been a delight for me to be able to bring this catalog, which for many years had been ignored and was kind of in, you know, less than prime sonic condition, hadn't been presented with the integrity and a nod towards the, the approach that Sinatra and his co uh, colleagues at Columbia and Victor Recordings took back in the early 40s. And, you know, now we've pretty much gotten everything that was recorded commercially and then some out to the market over the last 32 years. And that's, that's really been gratifying to me. Chuck, you should also mention about your radio uh, show with Nancy. I think it was like 17 years or 14 it years. It was a little over 14 years. I produced and co-hosted Nancy Sinatra's weekly radio show at Sirius XM. And that ended about two and a half years ago after the pandemic. And I am now doing a weekly show at KSDS FM in San Diego. It's called Sinatra Standard Time. And it's a mix of jazz, jazz vocals and instrumentals. And I really kind of focus it on the American songbook, which is something that I'm particularly interested in. Chuck, did you ever listen to Sid Mark's show? I know that he was kind of a story oh, for people. Man. Yeah. Not only did I listen, Sid Mark was both a friend and more importantly, a mentor to me because mm -hmm. from the time I was a teenager, I listened to Sid's show. And of course, when I started working at Sony Music, I got the opportunity to meet Sid and then be on his show a number of times. And uh, of course, as a broadcaster, Sid was the, the high bar in terms of presentation and the way you articulate and the way you present and program. And uh, he really taught me a lot about radio and about music. Yeah, and for I, those unfamiliar, Sid Mark had a uh, nationwide, what was the title of it? Was it like? It was called The Sounds of Sinatra. Yeah. That was the syndicated show, but even more uh, to my involvement he had a live show that he used to do every saturday night at wyny in new york city called saturday with sinatra and it was a four-hour show and my fiance slash girlfriend who later became my wife and now we're married 37 years when we were dating we would drive around new york city for four hours every saturday night and just listen to sid mark and you know, then go and have dinner when he was over at 11 o'clock. And it, it it was just such a, a big part of my life. Uh -huh. And, you know, he was such a fascinating person because he was not only a Sinatra expert, he was a jazz expert. So our interest in music really was, was very much um, aligned. And Sid started back in the 50s when, when he was... Uh, in his early twenties and he was working at the Latin casino and he met Billy holiday and interviewed her and Dinah Washington and oh, Louis wow. Armstrong. He had a program, uh, originally called the Mark of jazz. And that grew into the Sinatra program. One evening he, uh, filled in for a DJ that didn't show up 
and he said, we're going to do something different. We're going to play three hours of Frank Sinatra because he loved Sinatra and the, the phones lit up. And that was the birth of his, his concept of doing an all Sinatra show. But Sid really was, uh, he was a legend in radio and in the Sinatra community. And I can't say enough great things about him. I miss him tremendously. Now come to the specific title, Sing and Dance with Frank Sinatra, right? It was first re released by you guys, uh, I believe when starting was the 70th anniversary, right? Now it's almost 75th. This album was originally released by Columbia Records in 1950. And we put it out, the first LP that we did, the 33 RPM version came out, I believe at the end of 2019, just in time, am I correct, AB? Is that right? I'm sorry, 2020. So yeah. it was the 70th anniversary. Yeah, now going on 75. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And how did you? I mean, this, despite the anniversary, how did you guys end up choosing this title, picking this title? I know it's a historically important record, crucial his moment, his life, career. So how did you guys come across this title and said, "Let's make this one special again." Well, as some people know, the Columbia catalog of Frank Sinatra is largely recorded originally on session lacquer discs. Mm -hmm. So while we can take them into the studio and we can transfer them and then clean them up digitally, AB really focuses a lot on analog production. So I had to look at the analog tape masters that we had in the Columbia vault. And this is the one that made sense, not only because it's a landmark record and pivotal in Sinatra's transition from Columbia to Capitol Records and a whole new way of, of presenting his artistry, but it was also high fidelity. It was a tape master. It sounded great, and it would was really a perfect fit for what AB's model was. Yeah, we, we actually, uh, Chuck had presented with a couple of other ideas and concept titles, and, you know, we went back and forth. We weren't really feeling that it was delivering what MPEX wanted. We were looking for an album that was extremely unique, rare, that had historical value, and when Chuck came back with Sing and Dance with Frank Sinatra, it was like a light bulb went off. The team all listened to the, um, the, the tracks that Chuck sent us for evaluation. And it was a very quick, this is it. This is the title we wanted to invest in. And we want to pay tribute to the 70th anniversary. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Can you talk about like finding the tape and kind of what that experience was like when you first heard it? versus, you know, all the other things you've been working with? So through the years, my production partner at Sony, Didier Deutsch, and I had gone through the Columbia Sinatra Masters from top to bottom. And as I said, they span roughly 10 years, 1943 to 1952. And most of the early ones up until 1950, the actual session masters are lacquer discs. They're 16 inch transcription discs, which was the normal way of recording, the customary way of recording until magnetic tape came into the studios. So through the years, we had worked on the songs from this album but we had worked from the 16 inch session discs mm -hmm. in 1996. I believe we did a CD of sing and dance, but we retitled it swing and dance. And we included all of the arrangements written for Sinatra and recorded by him at Columbia by George Saravo. For that project, we used the session discs, which sound great. Uh, at that time, we really weren't looking at the master tape because the master tapes that were done back in 1950 were overdubbed and you know they were um they just weren't something that we went to you know it was a 10 inch lp those masters were kind of buried and we felt that the discs sounded really good fast forward to when i started to do tape research and and vault research for this project with ab 
I called in all of the master tapes, and what I was delighted to discover was that we had pre-vocal overdub orchestral tracks. And, and all of a sudden, I said, wow, these sound amazing. So I then did a little more exploration, and the archivist at Sony Music, Matt Kelly, found the original 10-inch LP master, and that's what we mastered this LP from. And it needed a little bit of work in terms of uh, repairing endings. Back in the day, and I don't know why they did this, maybe it's because the playback uh, uh, equipment was not so precise and didn't give the kind of sonics that we hear today uh, from vinyl records. But we noticed that almost all the endings to every song was chopped, meaning it didn't just fade out smoothly all of a sudden it would just stop the engineer right. just cut it and spliced it and i couldn't understand why and then i figured okay they probably figure people can't really hear you know the the fidelity at that level when they're playing back a 10 inch lp in 1950 or 51 it doesn't really matter so i thought that that was probably the reason why we never used that tape in the past maybe we just felt that it was you know too much trouble to uh to repair those fade outs and so forth. But anyway, I, I thought the, the composite tape, which was the original backing tracks and then Sinatra's vocal overdub, because they were done at separate times, that mm. master tape sounded really, really great. And despite being mono, it had a, a really nice depth to it. It, it had mm. dimension, it had a nice sound stage. So we decided to use that and then I, decided to transfer all of the orchestra only tracks which we used as bonus tracks on the new release in various you know there's various bonus tracks on different editions but uh, that really was the way we found and used those tapes you know i just felt that they sounded terrific um before we move on from the tapes i just wanted to um, ask a question around the source material again so sure. you were talking about master disc and as I understand it, and correct me if this is wrong, uh, at this point, the magnetic tape wasn't um, universally adopted as like the single source and that they would run these kind of backup transcription discs at the same time. Is Are those the discs you're talking about? Yes. So, you know, this album came at a moment in recording history where there were several transitions taking place. The first was the introduction of magnetic tape into the recording studios. So up until about 1949, 1950, all of the recording sessions that were done at the major labels were done by making an actual disc in the studio. And those 16 inch discs, which were usually aluminum coated with lacquer, became the session masters. Those discs contain breakdown takes, alternate takes, etc. Mm -hmm. When they started to use magnetic tape in early 1950 at Columbia, they hadn't fully committed to it. It was a new technology. The engineers were learning how to use uh, the machines and how to, how to manipulate the tape. So what Columbia did is they installed tape machines at the 30th Street studio, but they still used a Class A phone line and sent the signal across town to 799 7th Avenue, where they had two professional lacquer disc cutters. So for a certain number of sessions between 1950 and 51 at Columbia, we have overlap. We have magnetic tape source, which is a master, and we also have disc sources. What's really unique about this record and, and was one of the, the great advantages of magnetic tape is that when Sinatra came in to record this album in April of 1950, he had experienced a throat hemorrhage and his voice was not perfect. So Mitch Miller told us that he had the band in the studio. He had Frank there. Instead of wasting the session, he said, turn off the vocal mic. Let's just get great background 
uh, instrumental backgrounds, and we can come back when Frank is feeling better and he can overdub his vocals. This was one of the miracles of bringing magnetic tape into the mm -hmm. studio. It was You could do that, and they did do that on occasion with disc, but it was much more difficult and less precise. So that's exactly what they did. In April of 1950, they recorded all the instrumental tracks, or seven of them anyway, and then between June and October, Frank came back to the studio and, you know, he put on a pair of headphones, he listened to the instrumentals, and then he sang to them and they recorded his voice to the pre-existing instrumental track and the composite became the master. So we have both the master tape, which is a composite, which is what you hear when you listen to the original eight songs on the album, and then we have the instrumental backing tracks. This is all on tape. And then we have a set of disc masters with just the composites. There's no instrumental takes or anything. Mm -hmm. It's just, just the composited vocals with some alternate takes. So it's, it's really an amalgamation of master sources that we had to choose from. As a matter of fact, for a couple of the bonus tracks, I'll use American Beauty Rose as an example. This was recorded around the same time. And again, Frank overdubbed the vocal. Now, what's interesting is that in terms of tape masters, all we have is the composite vocal and instrumental track that's married together. That was the master that made the 78 and then was used for all of the subsequent issues, including our CD set in 1993. However, when I was doing research, uh, and we were transferring all of the Columbia Master Discs, we found that there were multiple takes of American Beauty Rose, both the instrumental and the vocal, on disc. But we only had one tape master, one take, the composite. So it was kind of, you know, it wasn't something that was consistent. Like, we didn't mm -hmm. have everything on tape and disc. But for American Beauty Rose, what I did is... I was able to use the, the master instrumental track, and we offered that as a bonus. And then I was able to go back to, I think there were seven takes all together on disc. They sounded terrific. And I noticed that there were some minor differences in the vocals. Because when, you, when you're dealing with a pre-recorded instrumental track, everything is exactly the same instrumentally. So the vocal is kind of locked into a, you know a pretty specific, space where it can actually live on the record but mm -hmm. i noticed that he was using different inflections and he used a different ending so i said why not take the best parts and i think from three or four of these alternates i edited together an alternate master but that was done from discs so you yeah. know we really we really maximized our use of all the source material I hope that explains it. It's, 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 you know, yeah, no, that's absolutely yeah. great. I, I think it's, it's a wonderful story and a wonderful product that came out of it. So Thanks. I think it, it just adds to the richness of, of what's, what you, you, you've captured here. So thank you for, uh, for laying that out for everybody. Yeah. yeah. By 1952, Columbia and almost everyone else, Capital, uh, RCA, Victor, DECA, they were all committed firmly to tape. And it was mono, of course. You know, all this is monophonic, which is is really in itself a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, people will say, oh, well, it's not stereo. But but mono can sometimes sound superior to stereo because it's got to be balanced and mixed at the session. The engineer has to know exactly where to put the mics, exactly how to blend all the mics and the instruments together in one unified monophonic track. Whereas with stereo, you have some more leeway and you can, you know, you can play with it later. You can mix it a little bit differently and raise or, or lower, lower an instrumental sound. You know, with mono, it's got to be mixed and balanced at the session, which really was a craft and a skill that the engineers mastered very early on. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I thought was interesting with the, the, kind of the outtakes on side two i've got the third the 33 i'll put out in 2020 was frank's involvement in the production we hear you know him talking to the musicians and saying hey move a little closer to the mic or you can bring the mic in or you know i thought that was pretty interesting can you talk about like his contribution to the i guess recording process and and that sort of thing besides just being a singer that came in and sang songs 
Absolutely. Well, Mike mentioned my book, Sessions with Sinatra, Frank Sinatra and the Art of Recording, in the beginning, and he's holding it up. That session, It All Depends on You, from 1949, which is one of the songs on the original Sing and Dance album, that session really was my inspiration and the impetus for me writing that book. And it came about because we don't have many original sessions in the Columbia archive. For some reason, they didn't record open sessions, meaning they didn't let the, the, the disc cutter run for 40 minutes. They, mm. they would do a take, and if there was a problem and they had to redo it, they would stop the cutter, you know, do a silent or, or uh, you know, um, interstitial band of blank space, and then they would cut on the next track. They would cut the new take. For some reason, there were four 16-inch discs that were just open mic session material from the session that it is it all depends on you and i came into their possession because they were given to to composer alec wilder by mitch miller who was a close friend wow okay when alec wilder died his estate sold these discs and i bought them what yeah wow. and this is this is before my involvement as a as a, as a producer or a consultant at sony so i had these discs for several years before that so when we did the 1996 reissue of sing and dance i went back to that session and i found an alternate take of it all depends on you with this great sax solo in the bridge that had been cut when they did the the, the record as a release so these open mic sessions are very rare and when you listen to it because we did include the session on the sing and dance packages you hear that frank sinatra is in complete control of every facet of the session he is literally directing the instrumentalist as to where to sit in the studio how to how to place the microphone in front of their uh, instruments. He wants a certain sound from, let's say, the the trombone section. So mm -hmm. he suggests to them that they turn around and face the wall of the studio. That's a brilliant suggestion, but almost would never come from an artist in that era. And right. why did he suggest that? Because he knew that the microphones, the ribbon mics that were capturing that trombone section, it would sound more mellow and sweet if it was reflected off the wall and came back to the mics as opposed to being placed right in front of the instrument. I mean, this, this is genius when it comes to an artist and an artist being involved in that minute detail of a recording session. And that's really uh, what intrigued me enough to write that book. And now you can hear it. Everyone can hear it. I had to describe it in my book before we released this session. Now you can actually listen to it and hear frank direct the whole shebang so to speak it's really an amazing document good it really gives people an insight of the talent and who frank is he's not just an incredible artist and singer he's a director producer and like chuck says you know reading it now you can hear it it's a it's a different experience it really is and it is the most detailed and in-depth involvement that we have ever found on any recording session source be it tape disc etc so you know this is about the most involved we can hear frank on any session that he did in his 60 plus year career and the, it is fun to listen to because there is back and forth between him i guess in the in the booth and the musicians because at some point frank basically has to say like hey 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 calm down everybody right <laughs> like, right right yeah. it's pretty it's pretty fun to listen to yeah so i love i love when he suggests that the prop department you know one of the technicians in the studio go and get a pad or a carpet to put inside the bass drum mm -hmm. now you know you guys are all music fanatics and you love records and i was a drummer 
and I know there's this big, you know, controversy or, or, or debate. Do we put the mic inside the drum? This is today. Do we put the mic inside the drum? Do we cut a hole in the, in the front head and let the sound come out? Do we, do we mic the back of the head where the beater is? I mean, there's so many ways to mic a drum and here's the artist himself listening and saying that bass drum booms. We got to, we have to tamp that down a little bit. It's just amazing to me. It really, really blew me away when I first heard it. So would that have been, I guess, would that have been during the instrumental sections or the sessions where, where he, you know, he wasn't singing, he, but he was there? And yeah. Would he have been like in the control room listening to what, what was happening and then instructing them how to improve it? Yes, that's exactly what happened. Now, what, what typically happened on a Sinatra session is it could have been weeks or months before the session. He would sit with the arranger that he had chosen and he would basically go through each song, pick the keys, and then suggest to the arranger what he heard, Frank heard, as the musical background. You know, I, I hear Ravel, I hear Delius, I want a little bit of uh, Puccini in the string section. That's how he would wow. talk, communicate with Nelson Riddle and Axel Stordahl and Billy May. He would come to the session, and the first thing that would happen is let's say they were going to record, it all depends on you. The conductor would get up, the arranger would get up, they would play the song down so Frank could hear the arrangement. And you hear this on one of the takes that we did, that we included, I think it's on the 45. He would stand off to the side and he would just like hum or sing the song softly just to get an idea of where the lyrics kind of fell into the arrangement. So he was just basically getting familiar with it. They might do that one or two times. He might hear something and say, I, I don't like what I'm hearing in, in, in you know, uh, bar 34. Can we, can we check the trombone section or the trumpets? Or can you take it a little slower? He would start to make suggestions. And then after those things were worked out, he would start going for takes. So what you're hearing is in between the rehearsal and them starting the takes, Frank literally went up into the control room at 30th Street, and he was listening on the speakers that the engineers were listening to the, you know, what was happening in the studio and to, to balance the recording. He was listening to it, and he was making sonic value judgments about what he was hearing. And that that's remarkable. I mean, most most artists... Most artists would, at that time especially, would just go to the studio and sing whatever the producer put in front of them. And here yeah. we have the artist functioning as his own producer. He's not only picking the song, working with the arranger, but he's in the studio and saying, hey, sonically, I don't like the way the bass drum sounds. I, I'd like to get a little sweeter sound on the trombones and you know, maybe we need to cut that sax solo. Uh, that that is what what is so fascinating here is that he was so immersed in every tiny uh, part of the process, which which really is what makes his record stand out. You know, people say, why are these records so important after eighty years, seventy years, sixty years? Well, it's because the artist created and had a, a very big influence over every facet of their creation mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so chuck i have a question though since we're talking about frank sinatra sessions uh not about this one specific but something that i was always curious about sure this the sinatra robin session oh beautiful Be because they were both like monsters in the studio they had like really big egos they wanted to yes. direct everything and yeah in between that you had klaus augerman which is like one of my favorite arrangers for both. How did right. dynamic play there in, in terms of, of this, the, the placement, composition? Well, the studio you, know, choices? you know, what's really interesting is that Sinatra did two albums with Jobim. He did the, the first one, which was arranged and conducted by Klaus Ogerman. And then he did a second session with Umir Diodato. Uh, it was about two years later the Deodato sessions. So yeah, that could have been a very prickly session, right? You have major, major artists with big egos, each one of them, Ogerman, 
Jobim and Sinatra all had established themselves in their own fields. What really unified them was respect. And I think Sinatra was so enamored of the Brazilian uh, bossa nova style. And he had so much respect for Jobim and Jobim for him that it just it just unfolded almost effortlessly. It really, you know, I, I have never heard from any of the musicians on those sessions that there was ever any tension. There mm -hmm. was no, you know, uh, disagreement. It was they came together and, you know, Ogerman wrote such such perfect arrangements, you know, for for a German. He really understood the Brazilian style so beautifully. And, you know, Jobim was was playing guitar and singing on the dates and, and Sinatra was just in, in fine voice. And I think that's what you hear on that record. It's 30 minutes, which is nothing, but it's 30 minutes of perfection. And, and I think that is a reflection of the respect that each of those people had for each other and their ability to come together and, and just create what I think is a perfect record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That record would be great if done by impact, right? <laughs> oh, I wish we could do it. And uh, who knows someday, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Deodato told me that when he worked with Frank and he did those arrangements, he said it was the same way. It was almost effortless. He said, you know, Frank was very receptive to his ideas. And when you compare the two records, they're very different. You know, um, you know, obviously it's a different arranger, but it's a whole different approach to the style, to, to the, to the form, you know, um, a Deodato, uh, didn't use strings, you know, he used more of a, you know, brass and, and percussion. It was just a very, very, it's a beautiful style for Sinatra, and I wish he had done 10 albums like that. I really do. Um, yeah. Speaking of style, um, before we get into the kind of one-step piece of this, because I do want to um, learn a little bit more about that process, I wanted to ask about style for the sing and dance. So um, in terms of Sinatra being a recording artist, it seems like maybe before this, he was more focused on ballads. Um, within his within his lps and this one he starts to shift to maybe where he's going to go when he when he you know in the future at capital absolutely um, can you speak to a little bit about the importance of um this as maybe an inflection point with it with sinatra style sure that's a, an important part of why i think a, B, and Impacts were attracted to this record because it is a landmark. It is a turning point for him in many ways. So we know that Sinatra in the 1940s, coming out of the Tommy Dorsey band, mm -hmm. was primarily known as a ballad singer. And that was his appeal and why he became America's first teen idol, because he was marketing himself to the young women who's significant others whether it was a boyfriend or a spouse were away overseas during world war ii and it's a myth that he never sang jazz music or up-tempo songs during that period because he did there's plenty of examples of him recording songs at columbia and victor that are pure swing songs and 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 doing songs that are up-tempo both in the jazz style and in the up-tempo pop style on the radio. But he was primarily known as a crooner or a singer of ballads. And we know that in early 1953, Frank changed labels and went to Capitol Records and started working with Nelson Riddle. And with Riddle created a whole unique and characteristic style that was completely different from what he did at Columbia. And that really was when he started to become known as a jazz singer because he was singing these great songs with, with a full orchestra, but a jazz orchestra. So, you know, we have these two very different uh, uh, views of Sinatra as an artist in the 40s as a ballad singer, in the 50s as a jazz singer. And I think... What, what links them is Sing and Dance with Frank Sinatra. 
what happened is in the late 40s and, and in early 1950, Frank was going through some personal crises. He was getting divorced from his wife, the mother of his three children. He had insisted on singing standards, and Mitch Miller had entered the picture at Mercury Records with Frankie Lane, and it started to do these pop novelty numbers like Mule Train so and Rawhide. So all of a sudden, the listeners didn't want what Sinatra was singing about. And Mitch Miller is the one who came to him and said, you know, they had just done one of the bonus tracks on this record, American Beauty Rose. And Mitch Miller came to him and said, you know, Frank, you do these tempo songs so well. Why don't we do an album in the jazz context, in the, in the swing context? And, you know, again, it was not something that was strange to Frank because he was singing those songs on the radio. As a matter of fact, a number of the songs on Sing and Dance were songs that he was singing with those arrangements in his nightclub performances at the Copa and mm. other places. So it wasn't foreign to him. But again, Columbia had just developed two years earlier the, the 10 inch LP, vinyl LP, 33 RPM. There was a new medium, it was high fidelity. Kids were buying them. They were buying them to dance to. They had a whole series called the, you know, dance party series. Mm -hmm. So that's why Frank did this album. And, and it really was a turning point in terms of how people started to think of him stylistically. And that's why it represents the transition. So this is really the tentative first steps of Frank reimagining himself as an artist in early 1950. Yeah. <clears throat> One of the things that I think is really interesting about this record, I mean, I love the version that you put out, AB, with all the the bonus stuff on 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 the second side and everything. But I love just the the spot in history it has too. 1950 came out as mm. three different formats originally, right? It came out as the 78s and and the 45 seven inches and the 10 inch L, uh, LP. Yes. Uh, I don't know. Can y'all talk about you know the, that the importance of that and and how it really seems like it represents a very early you know transformation in, in recording technology and also how Amer the American people were consuming music. Well, it's interesting because you know as we say and as we said earlier, this was just a moment where all of these things you know, coalesced. So you had the introduction of magnetic tape into the studios. You had the transition from the, the fragile and bulky breakable 78 shellacs to both 45 RPM and 33 vinyl. You also had that transition uh, in taste. You know, this is post-war, right? So coming mm -hmm. off 47, 48, 49, people... We're still listening to the hit parade in those years. Frank was on the hit parade in 47 and 48. And then all of a sudden, the young kids who were his idols, you know, uh, or Bobby Sox fans in the early 40s, now they're having kids, and those kids are now listening to this new kind of, you know, pop novelty music. And Frank was just there at that moment and floundered a bit. But, but I think the fact that you see the three formats, you know, they were trying to hit three different audiences, right? So the standard was still 78. Mm -hmm. So this came out as a four disc 78 RPM set. But then they were trying to really push the 45 format and both Columbia and RCA were making 45 RPM changers, little portable record players for kids. So they figured, well, we better put it in that format because we want to market that to the young set that's going and taking these 45s and their little record player, you know, on sleepovers and to, to school dances. And then at the same time, they were really trying to, to, to uh, solidify the 10 inch LP as a long play format. So it did come out in all three formats. And uh, the only format it didn't come out on was uh, seven inch tape, you know, because oh. reel to reels had just started to become a commercial product at that time. Columbia didn't really gravitate towards that until the end of the 50s. But 
Yeah, it's it's kind of an anomaly because it comes at this this exact moment where there are all these cultural changes. There's this uh, change in consumerism and the way people played records and the equipment, and then also in the actual aesthetics, the music, you know, the tastes that younger people were starting to develop and and the whole shift musically. It's it's just a, a perfect moment. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why this record was kind of ignored in a way, you know, Frank had fallen out of favor and, you know, people bought the record, but you know, it wasn't like this. It's, it's almost like I equate it to the beach boys pet sounds. Hmm. Pet sounds didn't become a classic album until the nineties before <clears> that. <throat> People dismissed Pet Sounds as as a brilliant piece of, of of musical art. Right. But it was. And I felt the same way about Sing and Dance. I felt it was the missing link. And, and to really appreciate and understand how Sinatra reinvented himself and became bigger than ever at Capitol Records in the early 50s, you had to understand this record as the stepping stone. And when you listen to it now, it's a brilliant record. It's, yeah. it, it's yeah, it, it's, I mean, I don't think AB would have chosen to invest in this if she didn't believe in it musically. Am I right, AB? Absolutely. You know, we, we talked about if we were going to do one amazing Sinatra project, it had to, you know, musically, sonically, historically, visually, it had a big checkbox. And I think this album is so important and it's such an important pivotal moment in sound recording and Sinatra's history and, and all the great records he, he, you know, released at Capitol really stemmed from Sing and Dance with Frank Sinatra. Absolutely. Absolutely. And George Saravo, by the way, people don't realize George Saravo was writing arrangements for Frank to sing on the radio as early as 1944. And Saravo had his own career and, and the same release day as Sing and Dance came out, one of George Saravo's biggest records, a 10 inch LP um, called Dance Date with George Saravo came out. So he was this guy who was kind of like pinch hitting, you know, Nelson Riddle hadn't really established himself. Billy May was, was not really established at this point. And Frank used Saravo through the forties and into the early fifties. And Saravo was doing these arrangements for Frank for his club dates and, and his nightclub appearances. So when Frank signed with Capitol Records, the first 10 inch album that they did was called Songs for Young Lovers. And of the eight songs on that record, seven of them are arrangements by George Saravo. Nelson Riddle got credit for that album. But if you look at the album cover, it says conducted yeah. by Nelson Riddle. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Saravo, yeah. I'll never forget this moment. Um, I interviewed George Saravo on the phone several times, but the first time I talked to him, I got the, the sense that he was sad. And he was sad because he felt he never got the credit he deserved for doing the arrangements for that first Capitol record because his name never appeared on the album, mm -hmm. although seven of the arrangements were his. And at one point, I could literally hear the ice clinking in his glass. So he must have been drinking and he started to cry. Uh -huh. And then he told me a story. He said, you know, he said that Nelson Riddle was a mensch. He said, many years later, when I was working with Tony Bennett, because Saravo arranged and conducted Who Can I Turn To? One of Tony's biggest hits, right? One of his biggest records in the mid 60s. He said, Tony turned to me one night at a session and said, you know, I was talking to Nelson Riddle and he knows I'm working with you. And he said, Nelson wanted me to tell you, thank you, that he he never got the chance to tell you how much he appreciated and respected the work you did on that first Sinatra record. And and Saravo started to cry. And it was just a, a, such a moment. You just understood that this guy was so passionate. You can hear that in his writing. So, so, you know, it wasn't an accident that Saravo wrote those charts for sing and dance. He was already writing for Frank and he wrote those beautiful charts for, for the first Capitol album. They were part of Frank's 
yeah, you know, performance in in the months before he made those records in 1953. So it's all of these things just kind of you know they kind of just crisscrossed and 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 of course we know when Frank went to Capitol, the world changed. I mean, it was you know he affected not just music and and art, but he he influenced uh, pop culture and the way people dressed. And there's so many things that that kind of you know came from that early capital period but it really starts with sing and dance yeah and i'll just say the fir that first title is a 10 inch called songs for young lovers not to be mistaken with songs for swinging lovers mm -hmm. and that first record is one of my favorites oh, i mean the beautiful. the 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 song selection is is great but the arrangements are just absolutely great like they're just beautiful songs Gorgeous. um I, I do love that that album a lot. Well, you um, know what's interesting, Mike, is that Saravo was really not known for writing ballads, ballad arrangements. So, yeah. you know, all of a sudden, you know, we're used to that very I, I call it almost society jazz band sound, because that's that's the way I picture Saravo's sound in my mind. And then you hear these beautiful strings, and you say, if anyone asked me, I don't think I would have been able to say that they're characteristically George Saravo charts. Yeah, but they were, and yeah. I think honestly, then when you listen to Tony Bennett and Who Can I Turn To, and there's this glorious, lush orchestra, you say, "Ah, I get it now." The guy had was multi-dimensional. He could write for strings as well as he could write for you know a thirteen-piece jazz band. He was just, mm -hmm. I, I really think he never, he never got the success or recognition that he deserved. So. Um, just one more question around the arrangements. Another person that, you know, is tied close to Sinatra's early career is Axel Stordahl. Yes. How does Saravo's style differ than Stordahl's? Stordahl, who came, believe it or not, from the Dorsey band, he was a trumpeter with the Dorsey band. And, you know, Dorsey played a lot of hot swing arrangements. I mean, yeah. you know, so the guy, the, Axel, he knew he was, as a musician, he knew jazz and he knew how to play hot jazz and swing. And, you know, Sinatra brought strings into the Dorsey band. He was the guy who said, Hey, I know that you're a jazz band or a big, you know, big bands were jazz bands, of course. And it was Sinatra who said to Dorsey, I think strings could fit into this equation. And S Dorsey bought into yeah. it. And I think that's where stored all kind of got the notion that he could write these ballad arrangements and that's what he started to do you know it was it was fred stultz and axel stordahl who started writing the string arrangements for tommy dorsey's band when sinatra brought strings into it and then when he went solo and did his first solo session while he was still with dorsey he asked stordahl to arrange them and they're gorgeous and you know stordahl's arranging sensibilities come from a classical background so and and sinatra loved classical music so this all makes perfect sense you know he heard strains of the impressionist composers in stordahl's arrangements he heard delius and ravel and Debussy, and frank loved those sounds and that's really where axel's uh strength was in writing and imbuing these beautiful pop charts with with just the right amount of classical uh, strains to them, they're not classically uh, written in terms of they don't sound like a Ravel song. But there are so many nods to Ravel and Debussy that you say, "Oh my gosh!" There's a very classical element to these charts. Saravo, on the other hand, wasn't really rooted in the classical. He wrote more as a pop string writer if that makes sense. So, you know, when you listen to the to the charts that Stordahl did for the voice of Frank Sinatra, his first concept album in 1946, he wrote for a chamber orchestra. And you say to yourself, wow, these sound very sophisticated in terms of uh, a musical approach. They're very classical in a way. When you, link, when you listen to songs for young lovers, you don't get that sense. It's more of wow. These are it's these are beautiful string parts that accentuate the 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 vocal without giving you a nod to any of these other composers or the little elements that mark their style. 
I hope that makes sense, but it, it does. And I, I just encourage know. everybody to to go and sample uh, songs for young lovers. It, re it really is one of my top favorite Sinatra uh, sessions. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. Cool. yeah. Beautiful record. Beautiful mm -hmm. record. Yeah. It's, it's quite interesting, Chuck. Um, uh, I, mean, I talked to Mike a few days ago. There are actually books about uh, jazz and modern art because in the early 40s, all those people have moved from Europe, right? All those classical yes. composers because of the yes. wars. That's so right. there's a huge interchange there. Absolutely. Well, you know, look at Quincy Jones. You know, in the early 50s, he went to France to study and he studied, studied with uh, Nadia uh, Boulanger. And, you know, of course, that was part of that whole movement of you know, the, the European influence and, and, and things did change. They did start to change. And Quincy was tapped to play with Sinatra in Europe for one of the set, one of the concerts he did with, um, oh, what was it? Princess Grace. Princess Grace. Yeah. 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 1958. He did uh, a concert in Monte Carlo. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he was called upon to do, uh, the contracting and the conducting. So he put the the orchestra together and he had some of the top jazz players from America in there. And uh, Frank really liked what Quincy did. Yeah. And, and four years later, he called him on the phone and said, hey, I'm doing an album with Basie. And it was his first, uh, second album he did with Count Basie. And he said, I was listening to what you did on Fly Me to the Moon at that time, it, the song was called In Other Words. And it was a ballad originally. And the way Quincy arranged it for the Basie band was, was in 4-4, four, four, you know? And, and it had a really nice light swing to it. And Frank said, I loved what you did with that record. And I want to record that song in that style for my new Basie album. Would you write the charts for this Basie record? And Count Basie, I mean, uh, Quincy Jones was like, oh man, I've known... Count Basie, and since I was a teenager, of course I'll write it. And that's when they made their first album together, which really, again, another landmark, really. That yeah. album, the the It Might As Well Be Swing, which I played in its entirety on my radio show the week Quincy died, that defines the Sinatra of the 60s. Mm. It yeah. really does. That was that was the image you get of yes. Frank in the 60s. And sure. then, of course, Sinatra at the Sands, which is just... Oh. Just the, one of the most perfect live albums ever recorded. Vibrant. Yes. Uh, I could do without the monologue, but, you know. That's fair. That's fair. I, I wish they had recorded six more songs and included yeah. them on that side. The first, like, three or four tracks are just oh, incredible. Maybe the perfect album side. Yeah. For yeah. any live album, really. Um, all right. So we definitely wanted to talk about the one-step process as well. So I wanted to ask A.B. around her vision for the Impex One Step catalog, just generally, because I know that you've done a number of titles now, around the um, selection process. Obviously, we spoke about you know why Frank, uh, this album, was included. But can you speak to your kind of vision of how you see the One Step catalog growing um, and some of the more kind of like detailed pieces around mastering and pressing? Sure, happy to. So uh, Impex One Step titles are chosen carefully in a group. So my team, you know, Bob Donnelly, Robert Slager, we sit around and we really think about what makes our customers wanting to invest in a One Step, which is um, more expensive than the traditional 33 and a 45. So the one step often has to check for us, uh, just like the sing and dance with Frank Sinatra, uh, the title has to have great sound quality, access to great uh, master sources, and also if there's any historical relevance or any bonus material we have access to. When I create a one step, I envision it more of a uh, coffee table, uh, coffee book, coffee table book. Um, and not just a, um, a gateful jacket. And one of my early inspiration, I'm going to hold it up, is this is an old uh, Sinatra on mm. a 78 shellac, and yeah. it's hard bind. And I'm going to see if I can. And when you, it's really heavy because it's, you know, yeah. peaking. But it's, um, I, was, I wanted to create something that looked like a book that felt weighty. And so when... Um, 
when the fans are listening to the music, they're getting a, a, a musical connection to the visual connection. I like everything to be visual and musical. And tactile creating art is all very important to my team and I. So the one step process is um, um, a challenging process and a very unforgiving process. With a traditional 33 and 45, we go from mastering to cutting lacquers, and the lacquers will make stamper uh, mothers and then stampers test pressings. We always evaluate our test pressings in a team. And uh, if there's a problem with the test pressing, we can look, the, look at the stamper under a microscope and see if the problem's on the stamper, if it's on the mother, can it be repaired? With the one step, there's no, we don't have that luxury. When we get the test pressing, you get one shot. If the test pressing has ticks, pops, broken grooves, or any issue, it is discarded. It cannot be repaired. So oftentimes we cut a uh, tremendous amount of test press, I mean, uh, lacquers to make um, the stampers. And sometimes these stamp, we usually limit about 500 pressings per stampers, yeah. but stampers <clears throat> break during manufacturing process, uh, things happen. So sometimes each stampers can only give us about two, 300 pressings. And if we're lucky, we can get about 600 pressings per stamper. And uh, our one steps, we always use the uh, Neotech VR900 vinyl formula. It's a different formula that's used with the traditional uh, 33 and 45. It's the same formula that I think MoFi uh, was using previously. It, it really helps bring down the noise floor. It's, it's much more transparent, helps with clarity. But it's also a formula that's not, um, doesn't go with all types. You know, it's kind of, uh, it goes by uh, uh, the music, the album, because some titles you don't want that heavy transparency. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, was, I was fortunate enough to um, get a, uh, a promotional copy and I was able to compare it against the 33. And there's a marked difference between the fidelity between the two um, and the 45. It's, I'm sure that the 45 speed, the, the vinyl formulation, um, and the one step piece of it are adding to it, but it, it's in, you know, on my system is, is noticeably, um, you know, higher fidelity and it's really kind of an incredible sounding record. So mm -hmm. I did, I did want to ask, um, I think I heard, uh, at one of, the, uh, one of your talks, you talk about how you may have had to go through a few different test pressing because there was a bright trumpet or you would just want to make sure like the levels were correct for this pressing. Is that right? Correct. When yeah. we got the test pressings, we noticed the trumpet was um, a little hot and it just kind of jumped out at us. So we did, um, we did remastered it a little bit and made some uh, EQ adjustments for, for the 45. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, Abby, yeah. so this uh, both cuts, the 33 and the one step, they were uh, made by Chris Bellman. Yes. Were these 45s done at the same time the 33 was done, or they were done afterwards, like uh, these days? I'm sorry, you said they were done. So the, thir the, the 33 cuts in 2020, right? They oh. came out in 2019. Yes. Now have a 45. Were those 45s done at the same time as they did the 33s or uh, just a different thing? Was it done recently? The in the sense of mastering, they were done recently. The 45 okay. was done recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We used the uh, same uh, tape source that was transferred mm -hmm. and done by uh, Chuck and Andreas Meyer, but the 45 was mastered recently. And, and uh, it's yeah. incredible. I love the 33, so I can't imagine the difference. It's pretty awesome. I have to say the 45 is quite spectacular. We we anticipated improvement. We did not anticipate this level of improvement. It, it sounds fantastic. Frank is so alive. It, he's right here in front of you. And as Chuck said, it, it's it's shocking how good it is, and it's mono. Some people some people look at it, they said, "Oh, I I don't do mono. I don't like mono. I prefer stereo." No, this it's 
there's no words how good this is. And then all the added value we included for this release. Because we, um, with Chuck and Sonia, we received three large cartons when we first started this project filled with um, 78s and, and little 45 and 30 um, and 33s and promotional materials and poster. So we, we, we went into this project with a lot of um, uh, resources and, and added values uh, for, for us to work with. And Robert Slager, our um, art director, he wanted to, <laughs> Yes, Robert did a great job. He wanted to uh, pay um, homage to, to the pioneer process by Alex, but he also wanted to modernize the, the look and feel. And because we had so many wonderful materials provided by, to us by Chuck, we were able to create three separate formats, and each format has its own photographs, illustration, um, but Chuck's liner note is most extensive in the one step. Hmm. It's the most complete uh, liner note. Um, the one step also had, you know, um, it was very period specific, you know, whether it was the texture of the paper, um, the, the UV spot, all of that really was very period specific. I, I have to say, you, you asked me, you know, earlier how I came to, to connect with AB, you know, Robert is such a genius in, in his field. I mean, you know, at, at Sony, I basically shepherded every project. I came up with the idea, the concept, I picked the rep, I went in the studio and worked with my co-producer and the engineer to do the masters. But then I sat with the art director and suggested photos and came up with, uh, you know, uh, an, an artistic presentation idea and concept. And Robert just gets it. I mean, he is, you know, my, my whole philosophy since I started doing this work uh, 32 years ago has been always do it with a nod to the integrity of the artist and the original creators. So when it comes to the, the packaging, you know, yeah, you can slap a brand new cover on it and you can make it look like a, you know, 2024 uh, design. That doesn't really reflect what the artist and the team in 1950 intended. Mm -hmm. And so I really am very sensitive to using original graphics and typesets and things that you would have found if you walked into a record store in 1950. And to me, that's the delight of finding these albums, you yeah. know, jazz albums and stuff. And, and I, you know, I picked them up and I'm like, wow, this could have been new old stock from 1955. That, to me, that's the coolest thing. Yeah. Robert just has this amazing sensibility. So I picked everything I could. I took, you know, Columbia 10 inch sleeves. I think I sent him 40 of them. And I said, you know, you could take this from that and just, you know what to do with it. And he just took them and, and he made this amazing package for each of the editions. You know, as AB said, they're all different and, and he's just so inspired and, you know, he and A.B. work very, very diligently and very hard. They sit together every week and they go through they go through every single detail on every project. And it just shows. And that's why I love Impex. I, I'm, I'm really privileged and proud to be associated with them and to be part of their team. I really I love you guys. Thank you. I love you, too. And it's been Amazing. great working with you on this project. And. And uh, Robert and I, we're just a great team. We, we really are. Definitely. And Robert and I are great because also we've been working together for 25 years. There's a synergy. Mm -hmm. We know what we're looking for. Yeah. And there's a process. You know, we don't just get on our computer and start designing. Robert goes through sketches after sketches. And without exaggeration, sometimes the sketches are in the hundreds while he's designing it out in his mind. And then he starts putting the pieces together. But it is very important to us that because we are a reissue label and we're working on titles that's, you know, from the 60s and 50s, that we honor the original integrity of what the artist's vision is, the designer's vision. And I'll, you know, bring up uh, uh, Kenny Dorm, uh, uh, Matador. Mm. 
you know, when we reissue that album, it was very important to us that we were able to find the same paper stock used for the original cover. It had the same texture. It had the Man, same. Man, that's color. detail. That yeah. was a lot of detail. And mm. we were very lucky. Robert did the research, found the paper, Stoughton was able to obtain for us. And then the factory no longer makes that stock. So that was the lot. We bought the last of the batch. Well, wow. Last of the palette. I think, Mike, you, you mentioned in the beginning, you know, the slip case for Sing and Dance. And, mm -hmm. and that's just one example. But, you know, it's like Robert found a particular texture that would have been, you know, uh, common in 1950, but it's uncommon today. I mean, that's the level of detail we're talking about, but he does that for every project. You know, I did the liner notes and, and worked with, with impacts on, uh, Ellington Indigos. Mm -hmm. yeah, and when I, when I got the test, uh, jackets and I opened it up, I was blown away because, you know, what, what he did for Sinatra, he did equally for Ellington and to me, it was so perfect. It was elegant. It was sharp. It was just, it, it really reflects what you're you're going to hear when you put the record on. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the ultimate, uh, the ultimate success is when you can marry the audible with the visual mm -hmm. and, and make it that full 360 experience. You know, that's, and, and I don't know any other label, I'm being honest, not just because I work with them now, but I don't know any other label that has been able to do that as perfectly and as consistently as Impex. Yeah. Yeah. I'm always excited to see what Impex is going to release next. Um, the, the catalog is fantastic. Um, and very, very different title selections, like the Three Blind Mice Box. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that was an you know incredible selection. The Kenny Dorham that you mentioned, incredible. The um, I have this. Chuck, you worked on this. This is the Heifetz. Yes, oh, yes. That is, yeah. I have to thank Bob Donnelly for that. He introduced me to, to that album. He's been telling me about that album for a couple of years, and it took me two years to make it to his house to listen and evaluate. And after I finished the first side, I was an emotional mess. I was in tears. It was so powerful. It was one of the most beautiful albums I've heard from High Fits. And I said, we have to do this and we have to do this right. You know, Impex um, is a boutique label. We don't have many releases a year, but every release is like a baby to me, you know, from start to finish. And not to nerd out on the on the the, uh, the the jacket itself, but like you can see, I don't know if I can get it here, but like there's a frame in the corner, just like an old record. Like mm. that, you know, it's just like it's absolutely beautiful quality in terms of the um, tactility of it. So you know, it's I, I think AB mentioned Bob Donnelly, and we can't understate his importance in every one of these releases because Bob is a he's a meticulous audiophile and he has truly amazing ears and you know i could work as i did on sing and dance in the studio with andreas and we can master it and make it sound great but it's really bob and his work with chris bellman or with bernie grunman that or kevin gray or kevin gray engineers we work right with. And, and that really is what transforms that tape that we end up sending them into this wonderful experience. And Bob is, I, I don't know many people who are as relentless and, <laughs> and, and tenacious in their, in their pursuit of, of what they want to hear and really great sound. And, and I mean that, you know, and the Lark was a great example because uh, Andreas and I did uh, transfers of that tape and, and, and the RCA, uh, Victor Red Seal, uh, catalog back then, uh, used the original session tape as their master. So mm -hmm. a lot of companies would, would take the session tapes and then they would transfer them and then cut up that copy tape that became the master mm -hmm. with RCA, uh, Red Seal, the session tape was the tape that they cut the disc from. So they literally spliced up the original session tape, and that's what we worked with. And Bob called us after we had 
our session and he got the, the, the master tape we sent and he said, I, I'm not hearing what I hear on my LP from 1957. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, we don't know exactly what they used in 1957. You know, did they use a tube machine? I mean, there's all these factors. And he said, well, I'm just not hearing it. And then he and Chris came back to us and said, we want you to transfer it again, but do it from one-to-one -one from the tape machine to another tape machine, nothing in between. Flat. And that's flat. And that's what we did. And, and then they were able to take that and work with it. And it's that kind of tenacity and, and, you know, persistence that makes impacts a, a cut above. And, and sonically the architect is really Bob Donnelly. He's, he's just got terrific ears. And I've been out to the house as AB has been, and he's done ABs for me and listened to certain things. And he's just got a great ear and that, 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 that's telling you can hear it in our, in our releases. When Bob is evaluating text pressings, he's not listening to one or two. And if the first two sounds good, then he gives it a pass. We open all 10 copies. We listen all 10 copies. We mm -hmm. make sure all 10 and he's meticulous. And I have to say, you know, when people say they love the impact sound, it really is the Bob Donnelly signature. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, well, this is a fantastic release. Um, thank, you. thank you guys for walking us through the history of it, um, the production story of it. It's, fan you know, it's just, it's, it's great um, to hear everything. So um, now you can get this on the elusive disc. And yeah. is there anywhere else? Can you get it on acoustic sounds and music? Absolutely. Direct or if you, you can get it at impexrecords.com, but that will take you directly to the elusive disc website. Okay. which is the parent company, but you can also purchase at any of your favorite, you know, audio retail stores. Um, it's available. It was just released this month. It's limited edition and um, the feedbacks reviews have been fantastic. So we hope that the people who buy it, you know, love it as much as we do. And it's both a musical and visual journey uh, for them. Yes, you can buy it at uh, any of your favorite uh, audio file retail uh, store or online store. Excellent. Thank you for everyone watching. We'll drop a link to uh, the Elusive Disc um, site in the description below. Um, Chuck and AB, we uh, are honored to have you here. We hope uh, in your next projects that you'll come back and talk with us. Um, Anytime. And, yeah. Any final words, guys? Uh, I, I just hope, and, and I'm hearing from a lot of people that they appreciate hearing Sinatra in, in such genuine uh, sound, that it really sounds like he's in the room with you. And that's the best, to me, it's the best praise that you could get for a project that you do. And then, you know, of course, everything else is just value added. You know, you're getting, I think you're getting a great story. You're getting great packaging, great visuals. And uh, I just hope people enjoy it. It really was a labor of, labor of love for us. It really was. And we're um, awfully proud of the, the release. Yeah. Very and we, we appreciate you guys having us on the show today. Oh, of course. Thank you yeah, for having cool. us. And uh, it was, it was great fun. All right. All right. Well, thanks, thanks everybody. Guys. Happy listening. Yep. Thank Talk you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.